Welcome to episode three of this mini series on evidence-based arms control and disarmament. I'm your host, Ashley Mueller, with the Geneva Center for Security Policy. In this episode, we speak with Matthias Novak, researcher at the Small Arms Survey. He will provide an overview of small arms and light weapons. Matthias, what are the main challenges in dealing with the proliferation of and trafficking in small arms and light weapons in the world, particularly in conflict-affected regions? Actually, the main challenges remain the same whether you're in a conflict-affected setting or in a non-conflict-affected setting, settings that just witness high levels of criminality and armed violence. It is important to understand the scale and scope of the problem in all of these settings. So, for example, how many small arms and light weapons are circulating across the globe? Uh, what type of weapons are actually in the hands of criminals, armed actors, terrorist organizations, or armed groups? How do these weapons enter the illicit sphere, or how do these groups access these types of weapons? And of course, what type of impacts do firearms circulating aglo- across the globe have on people's lives and securities? These are some of the main issues we look into at the Small Arms Survey. We know that there are about 1 billion small arms and light weapons in the hands of uh, people across the globe. Actually, 9 out of 10 of these weapons are in the hands of civilians. We also know that firearms are responsible for about uh, 37% or 38% of violent deaths across the globe. We know that there's around 600,000 violent deaths each year across the globe and uh, 233,000 are caused by small arms and light weapons. Um, each year. We do know that there's very important regional and national variation, however. So violence is unequally distributed across the globe and uh, it depends very much where you live, whether in an urban or rural setting, the regions where you live um, and also your sex or your age are a high predictor of how much violence you might uh, encounter in your life. For example, nowadays we understand that Latin America and the Caribbean region suffer some or witness some of the highest levels of violence across the globe. Uh, in some cases higher than any country at war uh, can witness. Uh, One of the core elements of data that we need to understand and need to address is size of the market, of the licit market of small arms and weapons. So how how many weapons are being transferred each year? Because weapons, for their most part, start the life cycle in the licit sphere. A legal producer fabricates them and hands them over through a licit transfer or legal transfer, an authorized transfer, to an authorized end user. However, at some point of the life cycle of these weapons, these weapons might become illicit and being used to illicit ends. In 2016, the Small Arms Survey estimates the global markets to be 6.5 billion US dollars, um, which is quite a high figure. It has increased 13% in comparison to our last uh, global study. And interestingly, but not surprisingly, ammunition is the largest bulk of this market. We do know that weapons have a rather long life cycle and can survive decades. Ammunition is clearly the one that is mostly needed in the, in the market. Then, of course, understanding the quantities and the characteristics of the weapons that enter the illicit sphere and are being used by armed actors, criminals, armed groups, terrorist organizations, etc. across the world is a key element of data. For now, our research has shown that the way that weapons enter the illicit sphere are mainly grouped in the following categories. We know that there are, there is illicit trafficking, so uh, weapons that are already in the illicit sphere that end up uh, in the hands of illicit users. We know that there's um, a lot of ant trafficking going on, so this image of um, container loads of weapons being shipped to a country at war does hold in certain cases but we have seen also that the vast majority of illicit transaction uh, or illicit flows across the world take place in untrade format, small quantities being transported by a small number of actors. Diversion does occur during uh, authorized international transfers, um, meaning that weapons can either be diverted from the legally authorized uh, transaction between country A and country B, but in some cases also uh, false information of the end user is provided, or we also know that after the transfer, of course, it is immediately being re-transferred to an unauthorized end user. We also know that illicit production of small arms takes place. Um, We call that either craft production or artisanal production. This can be crude and rudimentary in small Um, not very modern, let's say, um, uh, workshops. Some of these craft production, however, are very, very high level and um, sophisticated production 
of weapons that look like a, a manufactured weapon by an official factory. And then the recirculation of small arms, of illicit small arms, excuse me, is quite an important issue. Given the, the provided this uh, long life cycle of the weapons, we do see that a lot of these weapons can be used in one conflict. When this conflict ends, they will be captured by interested actors and being retransferred to another theater of war or another place where there's serious instability or insecurity, and the weapon continues its illicit life cycle or its illicit life. Uh, therefore, it's very important to understand this particular bit of the problem and making sure that when a conflict ends and the peace deal is being negotiated, that the disarmament aspect is really, is really well studied and well dealt with. The small arms survey looks to generate policy relevant data on these aspects in different ways this, and, and applying different methods. For example, we have conducted their study in the Central African Republic to understand uh, the illicit proliferation of small arms and light weapons, but within the civilian population. So this was not a mapping of the weapons of the armed groups, but proliferation of weapons within the civilian population. In this case, we apply uh, key informant interviews, uh, focus group discussions, in the field with the communities that uh, we were interested in consulting. Um, we inspect also weapons that are being seized by different armed forces, be it uh, uh, the United Nations peacekeeping operation or being be it national security and defense forces. Uh, with these different methods, we can aim at understanding what's going on, what is in the hands of the civilian population, how sophisticated or how modern are these weapons, uh, we can also approach a little bit an, or gain an understanding of where the weapon might be sourced from. Interestingly, we found that the weapons are being sourced in a multitude of sources and the multitude of countries within or outside the region uh, in general. But for a particular case of 12-gauge uh, shotgun ammunition being used mostly in weapons in, at use of the anti-Balaka group, most of these were sourced within the neighboring Congolese uh, manufacture uh, d'armes de cartouche. And being brought over again, and trafficking small, small loads being brought to the country by pangas or by foot by individuals. Other contexts in which we have applied these type of methods uh, um, were, for example, border regions between Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire and Mali, uh, where we looked at the mechanics of illicit arms trafficking within this region. And again, we found that uh, ant trafficking makes the bulk of the illicit transactions uh, within that subregion in particular. Ant trafficking sounds small scale. Indeed, it is uh, a few actors transporting a limited number of weapons or ammunition. But however, we do know that there are a um, vast amount of these actors transporting constantly small amount of weapons across the border. So this type of illicit flow is still quite important. Another method that we also have applied to understand what is proliferating, what is circulating, and how the issue could be addressed, how do populations suffer from this topic, is uh, household surveys. Household surveys are an interesting tool because they allow us to generate uh, statistically representative data at the national level based on general population perceptions or experiences with small arms or armed violence. Uh, this type of data can be used then also to design uh, policy, um, or being used as a baseline assessment to uh, evaluate, monitor and evaluate programs and projects against at the national level. Now what is key in understanding this problematic and the challenges that it represents is that it's a complex issue. It is often hidden and uh, very context specific. So our stake on this is to generate policy relevant data but based on a multitude of, resource, of uh, research methods, combining and comparing the different research results that we gain to try to generate the most accurate as possible, or at least the most context-specific possible data and research products that then can be used by the different actors interested in this data. As an example, I can cite the Central African Republic, where we did this mapping of uh, arms proliferating among civilians, where this was based on a request from the national authorities in, in collaboration, of course, with the United Nations mission to create a baseline that will then directly inform the national uh, small arms and light weapons strategy, strategic plan, and the national action plan that would address this issue. So this was an interesting take where such research is being up, taken up directly by the policymakers at the national level and being used to try to address the issue with context-specific and of course realistic measures and adapted to, to the problem that they were going through. Uh, but um, that's a little bit the way we try to inform policy 
and uh, generate data that is relevant. That's all we have now for this episode. Thank you to Matthias Nowak for joining us in this mini-series. Click the next button to listen to episode 4, where we discuss good practices of parliaments in arms control and disarmament affairs. In the meantime, don't forget to follow us on Spotify or iTunes or subscribe to us on your favorite podcast player and follow us across all of our social media platforms. Click the next button to get to the next episode.